Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Elliot and in this physics mini lesson, I'm going to show you a shortcut that makes it possible to write down the orbit of a planet around a star with just a couple of lines of algebra. The trick comes from a special symmetry of Newton's gravitational force law, which leads to the existence of an extra conserved quantity, which is called the Runge lens vector. In my last video, I showed you how to derive the orbit by solving the differential equations that come from energy conservation and angular momentum conservation. I'll link that up in one of the corners if you haven't seen it yet. It wasn't too complicated, but it did take a fair bit of work to solve those equations and figure out the orbit. So it would be amazing if we could just write down the solution with a couple of lines of algebra. And that's what we're going to do in this video. So let me show you how it works. The setup, just like last time, is that we have a star of mass big M fixed at the origin and a planet of mass little m a distance r away. We set up our coordinates so that the planet is in the xy plane. Then last time, we saw that the energy and the angular momentum of the planet are both constant. The energy was e equals 1 half m times the radial speed squared plus 1 half m times the angular speed squared plus the potential, which is minus k over r, where we also defined a shorthand k equals big G big M times little m. The angular momentum is meanwhile L equals m times r cross v, which we show that you can also write as mr squared times d theta by dt, pointing in the z direction. That's what the symbol z hat means here. It's a unit vector pointing along the z axis. Last time, we combined these two equations for e and l to get rid of all the dt's. That gave us an equation for dr by d theta, which we were then able to solve for r as a function of theta. We got r equals l squared over km times 1 over 1 plus epsilon cosine of theta. And this is the equation for a conic section of eccentricity epsilon, where we show that epsilon equals 1 plus 2e l squared over mk squared square root. When epsilon is between 0 and 1, this is the equation of an ellipse, which is the typical case for a planet orbiting a star. So that's what we covered last time. Now I want to show you the shortcut to deriving r. The gravitational potential energy function is very special. In addition to the energy e and angular momentum vector l, there's another conserved vector. It's called the Runge lens vector, and here's the definition. We're going to write it as epsilon equals 1 over k times v cross l minus r hat. I'm calling it epsilon because, as we'll see shortly, the magnitude of this vector is none other than the eccentricity epsilon from earlier. r hat here is the unit vector that points in the radial direction. In other words, it's the vector of length 1 that's pointing from the origin in the direction of the planet. We can write it in terms of the position vector by taking r vector divided by its length r. Because when you take a vector and divide by its magnitude, you get an arrow that points in the same direction but has length 1. Similarly, theta hat will be the unit vector pointing counterclockwise along the direction of increasing theta. So what is this random vector epsilon that we call the Runge lens vector? Well, let's evaluate it at the moment when the planet is at its point of closest approach to the star. We can always set up our coordinates so that the planet is on the x-axis when that happens. At that instant, r hat equals x hat is just a unit vector pointing along the x direction. Meanwhile, the velocity of the planet is all along the angular direction at that moment, which coincides with the y-axis. L, of course, is always pointing in the z direction. So what are we going to get over here for epsilon? Well, again, r hat is equal to x hat at this instant. As for the first term, remember that the cross denotes the cross product. By definition, the cross product is always perpendicular to the two vectors that you started with. So since v points along the y-axis and l points along the z-axis, that means their cross product points along the x-axis. Then since r is also pointing along the x-axis, we learn that at least at this moment when the planet is closest to the star, epsilon is a vector that points along the x-axis. But the claim is that epsilon is in fact a constant. 
it's always given by that same arrow pointing along the x-axis. I'm going to prove that to you in just a minute. But first, I want to jump to the punchline and show you how this fact lets us very quickly write down the orbit equation. The trick is to take the dot product of epsilon with r. We get r hat dot epsilon equals 1 over k times r hat dot v cross l minus r hat dot r hat. Whenever you take the dot product of a vector with itself, you get the length of the vector squared. But r hat is a unit vector, so this second term here is just 1. Now, to simplify the first term, we're going to apply a vector identity. The identity says that a dot b cross c is the same as taking c dot a cross b. That's going to allow us to write this first term as l dot r hat cross v. But now if I multiply and divide by m times r, I can write that factor in parentheses as m times r vector cross v, which is just the angular momentum. So this term here we can simplify as l squared over m times r. So that's the right-hand side. But now what about the left-hand side? Well, epsilon, remember, is a vector pointing along the x-axis. So when I take its dot product with the unit vector r hat, I'm just going to multiply by a factor of cosine of theta that picks out the component of r hat along the x-axis. So I get epsilon times cosine of theta on the left is equal to L squared over kmr minus 1. Now to solve for r, we get L squared over km times 1 over 1 plus epsilon cosine of theta, just as before, with no nasty differential equations that we have to solve. So that's how this shortcut very quickly lets us determine the equation of the orbit without ever having to solve a differential equation. All right, there are two things that we still need to check. First of all, that this vector epsilon actually is a constant like I claimed. And second, we need to check that its magnitude is actually the eccentricity like we defined it before. First, let's go ahead and get the magnitude. The easiest way to figure it out is to take the dot product of the vector with itself. This is just like expanding out a binomial, a plus b squared equals a squared plus b squared plus 2ab. So when we square the first term, we get 1 over k squared, v cross l, dotted with the same thing. Then we get plus r hat dot r hat minus 2 over k r hat dot v cross l. Now r hat dot r hat, of course, is again just 1. And then this third term, r hat dot v cross l, we computed that a minute ago, and we got l squared over mr. So the only thing left to simplify here is the first term. And for that, we're going to use another vector identity. The identity says that a cross b dotted into itself equals a squared b squared minus a dot b squared, where a and b here are any vectors. So when we plug in v and l, we get v cross l squared equals v squared l squared. There's no second term here because v dot l is equal to 0, since v was in the xy plane and l is pointing in the perpendicular z direction. So we get l squared v squared divided by k squared minus 2l squared over kmr plus 1. We can write that a little more conveniently by pulling a factor of l squared over k squared out front. Then inside the parentheses, we have v squared minus 2 over m times k over r, and all that plus 1 again. I also want to pull out this factor of 2 over m. So let me pull that out front, and then I have to multiply v squared by m over 2. But now lo and behold, the quantity in parentheses here is just the total energy E of the planet. So we get epsilon squared equals 1 plus 2El squared over mk squared. And if we take the square root, we indeed reproduce the same formula from before for the eccentricity epsilon of the planet. All right, the very last thing we need to do is check that epsilon actually is a constant. So let's take its time derivative and verify that it's equal to zero. We get 1 over k times the acceleration a cross l. And then from the product rule, we will get another term that goes like the derivative of l, but remember that L is a constant, so we don't get anything there. 
Then to that, we subtract the derivative of r hat with respect to time. Now, that second term here is actually just the angular velocity, d theta by dt, pointing in the theta hat direction. Well, remember, theta hat stands for that unit vector that points counterclockwise along the direction of increasing theta. To see why, suppose you started with the unit vector r hat of t at time t, and then it moves a little bit at time t plus dt. Both vectors are lying on a circle of radius 1. So the displacement vector between them, dr hat, just points along a little piece of arc length along this circle. And it's just given by the difference in the angle, d theta, times the radius of the circle, which is 1, pointing in the theta hat direction. And now just divide both sides by dt to get dr hat by dt equals d theta by dt times theta hat. So that's the second term. As for the first term, Remember, we know the angular momentum L is mr squared times d theta by dt pointing in the z direction. As for the acceleration, well, we know from Newton's law that the force on the planet is equal to minus k over r squared pointing in the r hat direction, in other words, back toward the origin. And that's equal to the mass of the planet times its acceleration. So if we divide up by the mass, we get the acceleration of the planet and we can plug that in to get minus r hat over mr squared. These mr squareds cancel on the top and bottom, and so we get d epsilon by dt equals minus r hat cross z hat plus theta hat all times d theta by dt. So the very last thing we need to do here is figure out what's going on with this r hat cross z hat. Remember that the cross product is perpendicular to the two vectors that you started with. Well, since it has to be perpendicular to z, that means that this cross product is going to lie in the xy plane. And then if it's perpendicular to r hat, that means it points along the theta hat direction. But is it equal to plus theta hat or minus theta hat? The answer comes from the definition of the cross product. It's called the right hand rule. You point your fingers along the direction of the first vector, r hat in this case, and then curl them toward the second vector, z hat. Your thumb will then point along the direction of the cross product, which in this case is pointing clockwise. So that means that r hat cross z hat is equal to minus theta hat. So we indeed find that d epsilon by dt is equal to zero. The Runge lens vector is indeed a constant. So there we have it. Once you've established that the Runge lens vector is a constant, you can derive the equation for the orbit with just a couple of lines of algebra, just by taking the dot product of the Runge lens vector with a position vector. You never have to solve a single differential equation to figure out the orbit of the planet. Now, is this the most efficient way to compute the orbit of a planet? Well, it depends what you mean exactly. The most likely reason you would write down the Runge lens vector in the first place is by first solving the differential equation for the orbit like we did last time and then noticing that it can be rearranged into a conservation law for a new vector. You'd have to be a very smart cookie to conjure this Runge lens vector out of thin air. But once you've got it in hand, it does make very quick work of writing down the orbit equation. So that's it for this video. I hope you found these last few videos about gravity interesting. I'll put the links to the previous two videos down in the description. The one about how to actually solve the differential equation for the orbit, and the other about how you can just draw the picture of the effective potential to very quickly understand the shape that the orbits will take. And I'll also put a link to the notes that I wrote up to go along with the video. You can get those for free on my website. Please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.